it's great to see all of you on here. Tim, thank you for joining us. Congratulations. And having you here is very special for us because you have helped us with two previous inductee surprises, helping us with Steve Trundolo's and Carlos Bocanegra's. Um, you're going to be inducted and honored Saturday, May 4th, here at the Hall of Fame. You're a first ballot Hall of Famer. Who is going to be presenting you for enshrinement on Saturday, Saturday, May 4th? Tina, thank you. Obviously, it is the uh, honor of my life to uh, be inducted into the National Soccer Hall of Fame. Uh, the gentleman who will be introducing me is Chris Sharp. He is the goalkeeper coach and assistant coach for the Colorado Rapids, um, has been in with the U.S. men's national team and um, is an absolutely brilliant, brilliant goalkeeper coach, amongst other things. Um, I had the really good fortune of finishing my career in Colorado with the Rapids, and I struck up a a friendship, uh, a lifelong friendship with uh, Chris Sharp. He he had seen me through uh, a climb to the mountaintop, a bit of a stumble and then a, and then a climb back to the mountaintop, uh, having come back from Europe wanting to uh, be the U.S. number one again, uh, reclaiming that spot, went through a really difficult near career ending in injury, helped me back through that and um, just somebody who is near and dear to me and my family. So I look forward to uh hearing him and uh, being introduced by him. We look forward to it as well. Okay, we've got a long line of questions here. We're going to kick it off with Andrew and then go to Michael. Go ahead, please, Andrew. Good to see you again. Great to see you as always, Gina, and great to see you as well, Bajon, as well. Always great to see y'all. Congratulations, Tim, on this honor. And just going back to when you started with the Metro Stars back not only in MLS Pro 40, but also that first season in 98 and having the guidance of Tony Miola. Can you talk about that first year as a professional and having the guidance of Tony and how it sets you on the path to where you are now? Uh, thanks, Andrew. Um, well, if you if you know about P40, you're a real soccer uh, fan because that takes us way, way back. Um, Tony was awesome. Tony was... Tony was American soccer. You know, the three kids from Jersey, Tab, uh, John, and Tony were um, were everything. Um, they should have statues um, everywhere for what they've been to U.S. soccer um, and putting putting us on the map in, back in, in 1990. And, you know, here I am, a kid. I'm just reading uh, Soccer America, you know, seeing Tony on the cover and then, you know, trying to dive around in, in – a goalkeeper kit that he wore in the world cup and just idolizing this guy. And uh, lo and behold, I got a chance to uh, uh, work with him and, and, and be his understudy. And uh, if uh, with the Metro stars and, and Tony is a dear friend of mine. Um, and if any of you know, Tony, he is a tough nut to crack and he is not someone um, who lets people in easily. So I'm proud to say that I'm a friend of his because I had to earn those stripes uh, in the dog days of summer uh, at Kane, at Kane College, out on the uh, fields that weren't cut and weren't watered, so I chased a lot of balls, and uh, I got in his good graces. And Tony became a, a huge mentor to me because he had been there and done it and seen it. And so for me to spend, you know, I don't know, three years was it? You know, just as his understudy, uh, learning and watching the way he performed, um, it's pretty awesome. And I got my first. He got suspended against Miami. I got my first um, MLS. Uh, cap, if you will, against the Colorado Rapids uh, in Giant Stadium. And he again, he was suspended, and he wrote me a, a a beautiful note in my locker. Again, this is a guy I looked up to. Just wished me luck and telling me how proud he was of me. Um, and, and that was pretty cool to have uh, for my first game. All right, thank you, Andrew. We're going to go to Michael DeCourcy and then to Ron Bloom. Go ahead, Michael. Thank you, and congratulations, Tim, on the tremendous honor. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you. You were, I think, fifteen in nineteen ninety four. Uh, when the World Cup happened here, and I know uh, as someone who writes about basketball that you had other uh, sporting interests in which you excelled. Uh, so I wonder how much 94 helped orient you towards soccer and, and what it what it meant to you to have the World Cup on your home soil at that point. Um, yeah, thanks. It's a great question. I, I It was, you know, I think it was a little bit of um, allowing – a, a little kid to dream and it sounds like a storybook but let me let me pause for a second night you know italy 1990 was like a bunch of ragtag college kids 
in a far off land. Don't even remember if I saw the games on TV. It was just kind of like we knew that was our national team, but it was so it was so foreign. So then in 1994, having the good fortune, I think I was with the U-17 national team out in Pasadena. We were training in California. Of course, U.S. soccer got us tickets. And here I am, 15-year-old, with my my U.S. national team buddies. Our shirts are off. We're sweating in the Pasadena heat. We've got USA painted on our face. We're behind the goal. That Marcelo Balboa bicycle kick misses the bicycle kick, but it was obviously what we won on the own goal. And like to see them parading around the field with American flags, it's like, it's at that point when you're 15 that you're like, oh, okay, I play soccer. I love it. It's fun. I really want to do great things. But like, this was the realization of the fact that you could be great. You could play for the national team. You could play in a World Cup. Like that. That was the moment. You know that that game in Pasadena. So, um, ha- you know, ha- having the World Cup come back in 2026, and then me in '94 realizing that dream was pretty awesome. Thanks, Michael. We're going to go to Ron Bloom, then Michael Lewis. Hey, Tim, congratulations. When you look at the line of top-level keepers from uh, Tony to Brad to Casey to you, why do you think the current generation has struggled to uh, gain its footing at top-level clubs? And with the current pool with uh, Zach and Ethan and the others are you worried about the keeping going into the 2026 world cup um well listen it's always good to talk to you we've we've been doing this for a long time and i and i appreciate and respect all the um things you've said uh and done for me down the years so i really, really do appreciate that and um gosh we had it locked we had we had this this goalkeeping thing figured out for a long time didn't we um going all the way back and yeah, it just seems like we've hit a little bit of a rut. Um, you know, I, 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 it does, unfortunately, for me, if I'm being honest, and I had this conversation with a, a top-level MLS executive uh, a couple of days ago, and I think the goalkeeping coaching um, has dropped a level as well, if I'm being brutally honest, because when you look at when you look at some of these top goalkeepers that we produce through the years, they've always had high-level goalkeeping coaches. And I can say that because I've seen the worst of the worst, and I've seen the best of the best in my career. And I think, um, I think high level goalkeeping coaching is down. Um, and quite, and, and quite frankly, uh, the game has, the game has continued to evolve. And I don't know if our young goalkeepers are getting pushed as hard as they need to, you know, to that breaking point. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it, uh, one of the things that Casey Keller said to me when I signed with Manchester United and I, it stuck with me forever. He just said, look, in order to be judged as a goalkeeper, you have to play a hundred games at the highest level. And right now our, our, our young guys aren't getting those games to even be able to judge them. Um, am I worried about the world cup? We've got a few years, you know, we've got a few years to go. I like, um, I like Zach and I like Matt. I, I do like Matt's um, wherewithal and fortitude and, and mental toughness. Uh, you know, Zach's talent is unmatched. And I've always said about Zach, he could be the greatest U S goalkeeper of all time because of the, um, the physical tools that he possesses. So obviously the balls in their court. Um, am I worried? No, not particularly. Uh, you know, I, I worry more about the team as a whole and making sure they're in the right place, but no, I'm not worried. And for you, you've done the work with the Memphis team. Any mm-hmm. ambition to do the high level coaching either at MLS or in Europe or with a national team? Uh, certainly not coaching, um, but uh, you know, being involved in the game is something I, I love and adore. Um, that's why I have the best job in the world at, at NBC with NBC Sports, being around the game, uh, being able to call it every weekend. But um, there's always an ambition to to be at the highest level. So um, I wouldn't I wouldn't rule that out uh, in the in the future anyway. Thank you. Congratulations again. Cheers. Thanks, Ron. We'll go to Michael Lewis and Matt Pollard. Go ahead, please, Michael. Thank you. Hey, Tim. Congratulations. Well earned. Yeah, I was in that giant stadium locker room that night. After uh, you did a job on the the Rapids, but congratulations on the honor. Uh, speaking of something way back, I remember when you uh, announced uh, that you uh, had Tourette syndrome. Mm-hmm. I was wondering how difficult was that decision for you to to go out and tell the uh, media about it. And I understand it was a different uh, social media back then. Maybe <laughs> you didn't know what social media was. Were you afraid of? Uh, maybe some negative comments uh, at the time. I think 
the New York media thought it was a, a, a very brave thing to do. Mm. Well, Michael, same, same goes for you. We, we've we've been there and done that and we go back a long way. So I, I always appreciate the respect you've given me. Um, I remember the day. I remember you guys all being there and, and certainly you. And um, I don't know, you know, threat syndrome has been such a, a great thing for me. And, and when I work and advocate for people in the threat community and certainly young kids, they don't always have the same story. You know, Michael, I was lucky. I was part of the popular group in high school, played sports, which makes you a little bit more popular, certainly in the 90s. Um, I loved myself. I just, I, I did. I had a lot of confidence as a young kid. So I'm thankful for that. Um, yeah, it was part of, I, I just wanted to kind of get ahead of it and 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 put it out there and, and um, you know, put it out there before anybody could really scrutinize and criticize me for it, knowing that I was, climbing that ladder and going to be in the spotlight had I become a starter. So, um, yeah, look, I appreciate the sensitivity with which people have uh, covered uh, my journey with Tourette syndrome um, throughout the course of my career. Because quite frankly, I'm being brutally honest with you, Michael, I can handle it. There's nothing anyone can throw at me that I can't handle. I do, as part of my journey, as part of my everyday, I advocate and I champion for uh, people who can't. And so when really nice things are written about me when when encouraging things are written about me and my threat uh, syndrome journey um it allows it allows youngsters within that community to read it and to feel empowered as opposed to uh people feeling like they have to rip me down rip me apart and tear me down and then youngsters read that and and they they you know struggle so i'm just thankful i'm um, thankful for people like you who have um given it enough time uh, and respect so thank you Great question. Thanks, Michael. We'll go to Matt Pollard, then Braden Norris. Go ahead, please, Matt. Hi, Tim. Good to see you again. Uh, congratulations on uh, on your achievement getting into the Hall of Fame. Uh, maybe one of the disappointments for the national team during your time um, with the USMNT was failing to qualify for the World Cup in 2018. How have you reflected on that, what that meant for you personally, and how the Federation obviously has rebounded from that with what Greg and everybody's doing go leading up to 2026? Yeah, what a uh, what a great question. I mean, I never thought I'd see that day. I'm being brutally honest with you. Um, I, I I haven't felt um, probably once or twice in my life have I ever felt that uh, weight of I'm not even sure I have the right word to describe it. Just this pressure on my chest. We we, we failed. We lost. Um. We went back to the hotel in Trinidad. I, I don't know how. We had a team meal. Um, not sure anybody ate. And I laid in bed, and 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 in the other bed was my roommate, uh, Demarcus Beasley. And again, a guy who had been there, done that. He was trying to go to his, I think, fifth World Cup. I was trying to go to my fourth. You know, you're talking about cement and legacies and all that kind of stuff. And we just sat there, and and I don't know if we spoke a lot. And it was kind of this. I think something happened in the other game. I don't know. Was it Azteca? Was it Panama? Mexico? Heaven only knows. It was something, some crazy call or at the end. And I can remember thinking, well, FIFA will intervene. We'll replay the game. Something will happen. We'll, we'll get another chance like this. We're not not going to the World Cup. And, uh, you know, just I remember being in a fog and a haze, uh, uh, you know, real, real low. You know, I'm never I'm, I'm not someone who's dealt with depression. I don't think I ever have. But I was close to it, you know, and I don't make light of that. I just remember for the next at least a week before I had to go back and perform for Colorado. I just remember walking around in a, in a, in a haze, like what if, and how was this possible? But um, rebounding, look, I think, it, I think Italy didn't make it to that world cup. I think Chile didn't make it to that world cup, maybe Holland. I don't know, you know, uh, big, huge uh, federations who have won world cups miss out. Right. And so U um, S soccer needed a wake up call, whether that needed to happen 20 years ago or 20 years from now, who knows it happens. So that was a wake up call and uh, U.S. soccer has rebounded from that. And, um, you know, they're on this journey now with this team and Greg and it started out very young and they're growing together. And the last World Cup, really good showing, uh, tough loss to, to the Netherlands. And so they're moving onward and upward. But, you know, you talk about that failure of of, of that team, of, of my team. It happens. Um, and, you know, you, you hope that it doesn't continue to happen. You hope you learn lessons and it feels like that, those lessons have been learned. Thank you. We're going to go to Braden and Sydney. Go ahead, please, Braden. Hey, Tim. Braden Nurse with the Denver Post. Apologies for my lack of webcam, but thank you for the time <laughs> and congrats on the selection. 
Thank just you. curious, reflecting on your time in Colorado, uh, what made the what made that move right for you at the time? And what made the time special for you, specifically that that first half of the season when you helped the Rapids to a Western Conference final? Um, I needed it. Um, you know, when it comes to, you know, when it comes to uh, at that time and, 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 and probably now too, um, you know, in order to bring a designated player to your team, you just need a lot of belief throughout your ownership group, you know, and, and, and Kroenke Sports and Entertainment, uh, in particular Josh Kroenke, there was a massive belief in bringing me to Denver and, and what I could do for that organization, what they could do for me. And so uh, I was just so thankful. I was so ready. I'd been, I'd been in the Premier League um, for 13 years, um, been in, living in Manchester for 13 years and the time just felt right. I was ready, you know, I was ready to put a cap on that and uh, move home. And, uh, you know, I, I, I can, I'm a Jersey kid through and through and never take that away from me, but the best place I've ever lived in my life is Denver. Uh, just at the, at the stage I was in my career, in my life, uh, the Denver community embraced me with open arms everywhere I went. It was just, I loved it. I loved living there. I loved playing for that organization, for the people I was able to play for a former teammate in Pablo Mastriani. As I, as I said, countless times, he was fantastic. Poor Rick Smith and, 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 uh, upper management again they just the way they treated me and the way they allowed me to have so much responsibility within that organization and of course like I said Chris Sharp uh, a friendship that will never die and uh, you know someone who I needed to, I needed to kick up the backside and I needed to be pushed to that final stage of my career and he was the one to do it great thanks Braden we'll go to Sydney then Ryan Tolmich go ahead please Sydney My question for you is, what is your earliest soccer memory that you can look back on fondly upon? Mm. My earliest soccer memory. I, I think I have a few, you know. Um, but I I, 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 I want to say, um, you know, on a on a personal level, I can remember. Uh, God, God bless her. She is doesn't have a ton of athletic ability, but my mom would go in our, our little um, backyard and we, we had an apartment complex and it was a brick wall. And I took chalk and I drew this, like I drew this goal on this chalk in between the bushes and I rolled the, roll the ball out to my mom and she'd, she'd tow it and kick it and it'd go all over the place. And I'd just dive around. And uh, I think that was my earliest soccer memory. Um, and well, I didn't have goalkeeper gloves on, by the way, I think I had like baseball batting gloves or something. Um, but you know, I, but but my earliest soccer memory, and there's some people on this call who I hope I can crack a smile, was the Marlboro Cup at the old <laughs> Giant Stadium. <laughs> and I sat, my mom got, I, think, I was a young soccer kid. My mom was trying to help this kid, you know, her, her baby uh, live his dreams. We went to the Marlboro Cup. We sat in the highest tier at the old Giant Stadium. I think it was, it was AstroTurf and the USA played. Peru. I, it was a red and white team. Peru, someone like that. Uh, I'm sure, I'm sure all you, you, you back to you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I was watching Tony Miola and I was watching all these guys and crazy. I mean, the fact that I was there at that moment was pretty special. That's great. Thanks, Sydney. We're going to go to Ryan, then Will. Go ahead, please, Ryan. Thank you, Tina and Arjita. And congrats, Tim. Um, you spoke about the impact that Tony Miola had on you and for a whole generation of kids, you know, there's, there's a lot of kids that grew up with you being their Tony Miola. You know, there's a yeah. lot of kids that became Everton fans because they saw you play there, or became Man United fans because they saw you play mm -hmm. there, became goalkeepers because they saw you play there. And and I just want to ask, you know, what is that like? You know, what is the responsibility like of knowing that, you know, you are, you know, a role model for a lot of players? And when did it hit you that you were making a difference mm -hmm. in that way, the way that some of your icons were? And, you know, now that you can kind of reflect on it, having, you know, been out of the game for a few years, playing wise, at least, you know, what has that kind of aspect of your life been like you know being that face of something for for so many young people um it's been awesome it's been awesome um you know towards the back end of my career before I came to the MLS my uh my beloved agent um and dear friend asked me about le my legacy and I remember I scoffed at the question I was embroiled in Premier League season and I couldn't even be bothered and I said so what the hell do you mean legacy I, I'm not I'm not concerned about that and uh He's a very smart individual, as you can imagine, and he was right. Um, 
because when I when I when you're done playing, all you do all you have is your legacy, and you know, hopefully, you're smart enough and you surround yourself with good enough people that you don't tarnish that legacy um, on your journey. So I, I'm very fortunate to have that, have have monumental moments, have World Cups, have um, longevity in the Premier League to where people can identify with me. And, and I didn't, if I'm being honest, I didn't do it for legacy. I did it to work hard and be successful. And I, and I was able to achieve that. But now that I'm, I'm done playing, I, I, I grab onto it with both hands because it means everything to me. I think when it really hit me is when I came home, when I, when I came back to Denver in 2016, just the amount of people who come up to me and say, you know, I'm an Everton fan because of you. And I'm like, God, I, I didn't realize I was that old, but that's cool. You know, like that's awesome. And I see a lot of kids, a lot, a lot of kids out there wearing number 24, which is the number I wore at, at, at Everton. And so I, I, I'm, I'm lucky. I, I, I feel humbled by the fact that um, I was able to inspire a generation or part of a generation. Um, so yeah, it feels good. It feels great. And uh, you know, I think I said when you're done and retired, that's all you got. You can't kick a ball anymore, nor do I desire to kick a ball anymore, but it's your legacy is all you have to hold on to. Thanks, Ryan. We're going to go to Will, then to Paul Living Good. Go ahead, please, Will. Great. Uh, thanks, Gina. And uh, thanks for your time, Tim. Congratulations on this, uh, on this achievement. You broke through as a young player in MLS before making the move to Europe. What was that like for you as a, as a young player? And why do you think we're seeing more young American players making the move to Europe now? Yeah, uh, it was hard as hell. Um, you know, you, you, so one of those, be careful what you wish for. I wanted to, I wanted to be great. I wanted to be a professional and I was able to do that for five and a half seasons in the MLS. And then I want to go to Europe, you know, and ideally I would have probably gone to a, a smaller league and, figured out how to be a goalkeeper, but I didn't. I went to Manchester United. So it was scary and daunting, um, but amazing nonetheless. And it set, it set me off on a path that, uh, you know, was uh, was nothing short of monumental. So uh, why are we seeing more of it? I, I think I think the world the world has cast its eyes on America and American talent and understands how um, how good some of our young players are. And so, you know, when you look at MLS and, and and the players that they're bringing through, some of them they're able to keep, but some of them they aren't. You know, and 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 you know, outside of probably three countries, you know, most most of the world's best players get uh, um, get exported. They do, you know. And so, like sometimes, sometimes when I talk to people, they they talk about MLS and gets a bad rap. And why can't we keep our players? I'm like, I, I don't know. Why can't Holland keep their best players? You know, why can't Italy keep their best players? It, it, it's again. It's just the way the world works. When you when you create talent, the the football uh, eyes are on the U.S. and and quite frankly, uh, it's the soil is rich here, so um, it's good to see them go over. That's great. Thanks, Will. Go ahead, Paul. Then we'll go to Tracy Rivas. Hey, Texas. Uh, Paul Living Good with WFAA, the ABC here in Dallas. Uh, my question for you is basically just about you know obviously. 30 something, 40 something years ago, the soccer isn't as big back then as it is now. You know, the World Cup back then helped grow the game. Um, and yet, you know, your time with the national team kind of like with uh, soccer is not the most popular sport in America, but yet you were mm -hmm. one of those names that was a household name among casual sports fans. I'm just curious, like, what you want your legacy as you're being inducted to the Hall of Fame um here in america uh to the general uh casual sports fan mm. yeah i mean I, I think i think when i think at least for the next 20 30 years every player that pulls on an team jersey is going to be a trailblazer because we, we we live in america and um you know football is amazing and, and nba is amazing and nhl and, and mlb like there's so many competitive leagues and rightfully so it makes the sports landscape in america second to none so so all of the u.s soccer players are going to be trailblazers in terms of in terms of how uh soccer is viewed in this country i i'm proud to say that i'm part of a, a generation i think back to like 2010 world cup that was in south africa certainly 2014 and then and then and then right the way through to uh, the last World Cup and the one to come, you know, we have turned, it, it used to be prior to that, I think it used to be the, um, the soccer fan was couldn't wait for the World Cup, you know, and I remember 2010 and you're probably talking about like 
social media is starting to come into our conscious, right? And 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 the spider web that that creates, you you started to see businessmen and women taking a longer lunch so they could go to a pub and watch the game and Grant Park and all these festivals and um, big screens in, in, in public parks where they're showing the game and serving beer and food. Like we were part of a generation that I think helped cross over um, and, and allowed the casual sports fan or certainly other, other sports fans to really take note of soccer and be like, this is a big deal. And so I'm, I'm proud of that as part of, you know, not my, just my legacy, but the teams, the U S national teams that I played on, that's, that's important. And then to follow up on that with the upcoming world cup, with your perspective, you know, what kind of opportunity that these players now have to grow it even more? Uh, can you just elaborate on that, on that aspect? More pressure. I mean, more pressure. I talked about, I talked about our guys in, uh, in 94, it was special. And, and they probably would tell you they felt pressure for sure, but like, they weren't supposed to do anything, you know, let alone, let alone get out of the group, you know, and this current team is a lot more pressure, you know, biggest world cup in terms of finances and numbers and size. Um, this is going to be the greatest world cup in the history of, of our sport. I mean, I don't think that's talking it up too much. That's reality. And so, <laughs> you know, our young, our young guys are going to have a, you know, a lot of pressure on their shoulders, but they can handle it. And, um, you know, with pressure comes greatness, you know, and the opportunity to be great. So uh, they have a, they have an incredible opportunity. Thank you. Congratulations again. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. We're going to go to Tracy, then Jordan, back to Sydney and Andrew. Go ahead, please, Tracy. Thank you, Gina. Um, congratulations, Tim. Um, I'm Tracy Revis. I'm covering for the Afro-American newspaper. This is a little bit to piggyback off of the previous question, talking about soccer popularity and everyone's getting ready for 2026. Um, um, so first I have a tough question. Sorry, I have to ask that mm -hmm. first um, and then an easy one. What do you think, it, do you think enough is being done to generate interest and um, to underserved communities uh, to get involved in soccer? I know you've done some work with uh, mini pitches and the US Soccer Foundation. Um, what do you think enough is being done or what could be done to engage you know, youth in underserved communities? Um, no, not a tough question for me. I'm mean, gosh, no, not, there's not, not enough being done. I don't think, uh, I don't think soccer in America has ever done enough for the Brown and black communities. Um, you know, I think when you look across the, the fan bases and, um, throughout our sport, um, there just isn't, there isn't enough, um, being done in these underserved communities. I think we, you know, I spoke about it this week. We do we do a we do a terrible job in America of going into underserved communities and taking one or two um, players out of that and thinking we did a great job. There's a there's a pretty awesome movie. Um, of, it's called The Blind Side. I'm sure most of you've seen it. In fact, my daughter goes to the school that um, uh, that the movie was based off of, and um, we take one 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 player, one kid out of out of an underserved community, and we make a movie about it. And we feel good about ourselves. The reality is, we have to go into these um, underserved communities, these lower socioeconomic households, and uh, create a space for for them to play, to be safe, to be active. You know, it's, again, it's one of the, I just got back from Las Vegas and with the Tim Howard Foundation and the U.S. Soccer Foundation, we launched a, a mini pitch or two mini pitches actually in a beautiful park. Uh, in North Las Vegas. And um, is that going to change the landscape? Absolutely not. But uh, one field at a time, one community at a time, it can be done. Um, this call isn't long enough for you and I to discuss how we get there. Uh, but yeah, I think that there's that more can be done, particularly uh, with soccer in America and how uh, that served. By the way, by the way, there's not a lot of black and brown faces in Premier League stadiums either. So uh, we can, you know, there's, there's, um, there's there's more that can that can be done, but it's not just a a problem here in America. But this is where we live, and this is where we need to serve. So yes, I appreciate the question. Great. So one e my easy question is: you've had a lot of um, accomplishments in your career. What would you say was uh, something that um, is the most memorable to you, whether it's a trophy or a win or an award mm -hmm. or a, st a stat? <laughs> um. Gosh. Yeah. I think I'm. I, I think I'm lucky because I have a I have a few answers to that question, but. Um, Playing for my country, um, 
at three, you know, at three World Cups and being a part of three World Cup teams is uh, any any little kid will tell you um, the most special thing you could possibly do is play for your country. And if you're lucky enough, play in a World Cup. And so without question, that first day in Birmingham, Alabama at Legion Field, never been there before, never been there since pulling on that U.S. National Team shirt and walking across the line for my first cap was um, it's certainly up there. Wonderful. Thank you. Tracy, I want to be mindful of everyone's time. We have about 10 minutes left here. Um, then we're going to go to Jorn and then Sydney. Go ahead. Yeah, Tim, uh, Jorn at the Hall of Fame again. Congratulations. Um, and I also want to thank you. Uh, I feel like you've been an advocate of what we're doing at the Hall of Fame here uh, before even becoming a member, uh, whether it was our Central 11 campaign when we were getting ready to open the building heading into 2018 or yeah helping us with two inductees. So we really appreciate it. And we're incredibly excited to, to get you in here finally. So uh, if you, if you would, if you quit playing, we could have gotten you in sooner, you know, but you had to keep <laughs> retirement. But uh, with that said, you know, as, as you walk up on the stage on Saturday, May 4th and put on that red jacket, what, what's going to be going through your mind and, and what's that, what's that moment going to mean to you? Well, I got to say selfishly, I was trying to pay it forward, getting your good graces to hopefully maybe one day I could, I could be in the hall, um, but it's all, it's amazing. It's just amazing to, um, you know, hear about um, hear about the Hall of Fame growing up in. You know, I'm from, I'm from New Jersey, up in Oneonta, New York. Oneonta was a world away because I certainly never went. And hearing about um, you know what it was, what that was, and what that consisted of, and then and then um, what has been created. Uh, there in texas and just you know playing on that field and 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 watching it being constructed um you know it, it it the hall of fame is so special to me so special that i didn't want to know my daughter who who's uh you know aspiring to become a division one college soccer player and well on her way kept going dad when are you going to get in the hall of fame dad when is it and i said i don't know she said well how many years do you have to be retired i said i don't know and she wanted all these answers and i didn't want any of the answers because it was so special i just wanted to be surprised you know and and uh, i didn't want to know the time or when or or, or if i just it, it's so special that um if you're fortunate enough to to be selected and inducted um you know you 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 go down in history and so i i've never you know I, i've never been inside um, which also is very special to me that the first time I'm ever going to step foot inside is, is a, with my family and friends. Um, you know, I think it hit me really hard. I had to fight back tears on live television uh, on NBC, um, and try and collect myself because, um, I had this wave of emotion that I, I guess I didn't expect, you know, you play in big games, you have big moments and, um, you're, you're hard and you're chiseled and, and, and you have this, this fortitude that you think um, you can't be touched. And then you get a moment like that. And it's just a calm. It, it just meant it was a culmination of like all the great things in my life. And I make no bones about it. Most of 99% of the great things that have happened in my life are because of soccer. Um, so I'm very, I'm very lucky. I'm very fortunate and uh, just cannot wait. I am so excited to pop off my own suit jacket and pull on that red, that red blazer, because uh, it will put me in a, um, in, at, on a level that uh, is nearly untouchable. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, Jordan. Go ahead, Sydney, then we'll go to Andrew. Hi again, Sydney Staples for DG10 Sports. Um, would you have done anything differently in your career now that you have the ability to look back on it? Um, yeah, I have a few regrets. I mean, I think that um, in terms of decisions and choices, no, no. Um, Every single thing I did was perfect. Signing for the Metro Stars, going to Manchester United, leaving for Manchester United to go to Everton, uh, which was one of the greatest decisions I ever made in terms of choosing Everton once I, once I left, because I had a couple choices, um, playing for my national team and then ultimately finishing my career with the Colorado Rapids. So, um, yeah, it was uh, – I don't have any regrets in, in terms of those decisions <laughs> I probably regret coming for a few crosses and not getting it, you know, that type of thing. But uh, those are, those are um, small things, but no, like zero regrets in terms of doing things differently in my career. Good way to live. Regret free. Okay. <laughs> to Ryan, go ahead. Back to Andrew, please. 
Thanks again, Gina. Tim, of the three um, people here, who was the most temperamental that you had to deal with in the most intense? So Sir Alex Ferguson, David Moyes, and your goalkeeping coach was going to introduce you. Uh, um, I think I think David Moyes because Sir Alex Ferguson was very scary. <laughs> I I was a young kid. I, mean, I was a young kid when uh, I went to Manchester United, 23, 24, 25, somewhere in there. And so I was I was just a kid, you know, a, a scared kid in the corner. Yes, sir. No, sir. I didn't really, you know, it was a really big team with big players, and I wasn't. My my voice wasn't there to be heard. Um, so although that's scary, um, you don't really you don't have, really have much say. When I went to Everton, David Moyes, uh, I was a big signing for Everton. He 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 heaped a lot of responsibility and trust on my shoulders. And when that happens, the tide turns, and you have to have tough conversations with the manager when the team isn't playing well or someone else isn't turning up you get the brunt of of um, that fury. And so uh, David Moyes was the scariest, but he um, I'd run through the gates of hell seven days a week for David Moyes. So he is uh, someone who I love dearly, who I respect, and, yeah, the scariest for sure. Congrats again, sir. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Andrew. We'll go to Ryan, then wrap with Matt. Go ahead, please, Ryan. Thank you uh, for letting me get another one in here. Uh, <laughs> Tim. I was at the World Cup, uh, you know, in 2022 in Qatar, and I would get like in an Uber and I'd have an, an Uber driver who doesn't speak a word of English. I'd say I'm from the U.S. and they'd go, oh, Tim Howard, Belgium. <laughs> and there's there's so few times where like a player increases their legacy in a game where they don't necessarily win. And obviously mm -hmm. that game is is such mm -hmm. a huge part of your legacy and a way that many people remember you by, you know, like mm -hmm. looking back at that moment in that game, you know, how do you kind of reflect on that and, and what it has meant to the perception of you, not just in the U.S., but also all over the world? Mm. Great question. I mean, it, it, you know, it was the single greatest goalkeeping performance of my career. Um, yeah, you, you know, on the one hand we lost, but man, we gave it a hell of a fight and we were in it and we, had chances to, you know, push it to extra time. And what does that look like? And so, um, you know, I, again, going back to legacy, I, I've, the one thing people say to me, if anyone comes up to me and says anything, whether I'm in the supermarket, in the airport, uh, which I'm in a lot or anywhere on the street, you know, they talk about the Belgian game. And I think, I think what's special to me now is I have the opportunity to share with hundreds, if not thousands of fans everywhere I go and they tell me where they were, where they were, what they were doing, who they were with um, when they were watching the Belgium game. So they were in there, you know, they had their, a lot of times, and this is the crazy thing about generations, right? A lot of times they'll come up to me with their son or daughter. And like, I was, I was holding my son or daughter watching the game. And now, and now that, that baby is, is, um, you know, kicking a soccer ball of their own and uh, however old, eight, nine years old, um, so it's it's special to have that that one that one shiny moment that okay I had a I had a lot of great moments but that one that people can cling on to, and so uh, I'm very fortunate and I and I appreciate the fact that um, that has added to my legacy. Great, thanks, Ryan. And we will wrap with Matt. Go ahead, Matt. Uh, Excuse me. Yeah, Sam. Thank you so much for the time. If you were to jump in a time machine right now and go back mm. to August 1998. And you get five minutes in the locker room alone with your younger self at Giant Stadium right before your debut. What are you talking about? Yeah. You what are you telling your younger self? Um, yeah, yeah, I, I brought myself to that moment a couple of times because I've been, I've been asked to. Um, you know, I, I, it, the funny thing about that question is, um, being great, chasing greatness, having a Hall of Fame career, um. It's scary as hell. There's a lot of low. There's a lot of low moments. So, you know, if if someone were to ask me if I could do it all over again, I wouldn't want to do it all over again because I know how hard it was, um, and I don't. I wouldn't really want to have to make those sacrifices over again. Um, but I think I'd tell my younger self that uh, if you work hard enough, and I mean, I truly mean work hard enough, and sacrifice you know, be willing to sacrifice nearly everything in your life to be great, then things will turn out okay. 
Um, but yeah, hell of a hell of a conversation <laughs> with that young kid. All righty. Everyone, thank That's you so good. much. Gina, just one thing. I do have some breaking news as we were talking about the Belgium game. Tim has been kind enough to loan the Hall of Fame his gloves and boots from that match. So they will be on display starting uh, May 4th on induction day. So thank you, Tim. That's pretty amazing stuff. We appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so That's much. Awesome. For anybody who's coming, get your selfie. <laughs> <laughs> gloves and boots. That's awesome. Tim, thank you so much. We look forward thank to seeing you in a couple weeks. And thanks to all the media who joined us as well. Great questions, great conversation. We really look forward to seeing all of you here in a few weeks for those of you who can make it to Frisco.